Uh, we have a very illustrious panel here. I'm going to quickly get out of their way. Uh, we will hear three presentations, each about 10 minutes, reacting to what we've talked about already uh, this morning. Uh, this comes from the provider side. We start with Kevin Callahan, who's the CEO since 1985, so been around Exeter Hospital for a long time, obviously one of the flagship hospitals in the state, um, therefore one that's under a lot of pressure uh, to change uh, the, the way it does business these days. And I think Kevin will have an interesting perspective on, on that, on the, on the challenges you face as a large flagship hospital in a, in a state like New Hampshire. Second, by the way, I'm doing these bios really quickly because there is a detailed bio for each of these speakers in your packet. And I always cringe when people start reading the whole bio in, in this kind of form. So that's all the introduction you get to Kevin. You can read the rest of it in his, uh, in his bio. But CEO of the of a flagship hospital for since 1985 is a pretty good description of, uh, uh, of somebody. Um, Peter Gosline is, is next. He's the chief administrative officer of the Upper Connecticut Valley Hospital. And he told me the shorthand is that he's the CEO of four hospitals really up there, the part-time CEO of four hospitals that they're trying to bring together. We've already had uh, Representative Sherman and others talk about the uh, issues that are different in uh, northern New Hampshire than they are down this part of the state. So he'll be the second speaker today. And then third, we have Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum, Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum, who said, make sure you emphasize that I am a practicing uh, a doctor. Um, but as you look at her bio, you'll see she's also been very active on the policy side. So she's been involved in many different kind of quality assurance efforts and other kinds of uh, efforts across the, the state. But her day job is as the chief medical officer for the Southern uh, New Hampshire Medical uh, Center. So three pretty different perspectives, and we'll take them one by one. Uh, I think folks decide they want to come to the podium for their 10 minutes of remarks, and then I said I would have uh, as, as a tough a question as I could come up with for each of them to start the questioning, and then we'll throw it open to the audience after that. Uh, with that, uh, Kevin Callahan. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> So I've been uh, I've had a couple of conversations regarding uh, this forum with Joel as well as a few others, and it has been hammered into me that I am limited to no more than ten minutes, and I know my reputation may precede me, so I'm going to try to keep my comments uh, on ten minutes uh, and allowing enough time certainly for interaction with uh, the audience here this morning. And and when I came in here this morning, I saw my name uh, tag seat res reservation on the floor with a tipped uh, cup of coffee, and I went, "What party did I miss?" You know, so. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll we'll have an uh, interacting and uh, engaging conversation. And when uh, Representative Sherman had asked me to participate in this, and I was looking at the name of the panel, the name of the panel is essentially uh, reforming healthcare delivery and the payment for healthcare. And, and I kind of reflected on that and what is the connotation of reform. And I was thinking about the historical reference to reforms, and there have been some great reforms. Uh, over certainly over the last uh, you know hundred years, and we can think of many of them, and rarely do, does the reform produce the results that the reformers had intended. And that's that's just kind of the nature of complex systems, and it's very difficult for us to understand complex systems and how they interact with each other. So as I kind of thought about this panel this morning, I, I really thought it would be more about innovation. Uh, and so what I'm going to spend a little time is chatting about innovation. <clears throat> Can I just uh, grab my water there, if I, uh, Peter? Thanks. Thanks. I was on. A, I, had the, I had the benefit of being on a plane coming up from the south, <clears throat> and everybody in the plane was sick. So uh, be patient, <laughs> everybody. So, um, so what I want to talk about <clears throat> a little bit uh, this morning is about this notion of innovation, and to kind of maybe shift away from the paradigm of reform. Um, and I think it's really critical to reflect upon that because there is an enormous amount of innovation that's occurring below the surface as we speak here today within healthcare delivery. The reform transition to innovation, <clears throat> if we think about innovation, has to be rational. And how we approach uh, the transformation of the healthcare delivery system that is ongoing now has to be rational as well. So, what can we expect? from uh, healthcare reform, <coughs> healthcare innovation. There are probably a few key things I think that we can expect. In my view, a minimum is something that stimulates and supports the goals and objectives of the triple aim and the sustainability of the healthcare system. So that's an important concept to understand. The other concept, as I wanted to uh, reference, is the fact that 
what is old sometimes is new again. And as I was chatting with a few people here this morning, <clears throat> and you're right, I've been in the healthcare delivery space for a long time, some of these concepts, this movement toward rethinking the way healthcare providers should be paid, is a place that I was at some years ago. And so back in the 1990s, that same fundamental question was being raised, certainly in the context of health care reform as being espoused by the Clinton administration. But we had talked a lot about in the 1990s, how do we move to a different payment system? How do we engage patients? How do we change the way we manage patient care? It was not as sophisticated an understanding back in the 1990s as I think we have now as health care uh, providers. But nonetheless, there was a basic concept that if you change the payment system and you change the alignment system, maybe we could perhaps produce better outcome. Better outcome from the standpoint of conservation of resources, an improved patient care experience, as well as improved patient care quality. So now when we think about what's old and, uh, what was old and what is new now, back in the 1990s, <clears throat> we as a healthcare organization engaged in a, a variety of different attempts to try to take on risk, provider risk, financial risk, and to try to align provider systems within the Seacoast to better manage patient care. This is in the 1990s. Well, m the experiment in the 1990s was not particularly successful for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and it always causes me to pause to think about those reasons in the context of where we are, uh, where we are today. What were some of the reasons why the approach to population management that's the term we use today. But what, was, what were some of the problems uh, we encountered in the 1990s of managing patient care for a fixed price, capitation largely back in, back in the 1990s? There were many. Um, and to a certain degree, perhaps above it all, was a relative degree of naivete on the part of providers, insurers, and certainly patients in terms of understanding what it means to manage the care of a patient over time in an economically sustainable way. We had very poor provider alignment, really not significant alignment at all. Um, we had no significant, deep, uh, sustainable insurer commitment to changing the way healthcare is financed and engaging providers and patients along that pathway. We had really inadequate, insufficient information technology to really understand the global nature of the way patient care is being provided, both clinically and economically. And we didn't really have any sustainable patient engagement at all. So here we are now, 2015, kind of thinking about the questions about how do we change the paradigm in which care is financed and care is provided? We use different language in the 1990s, but the questions are still germane. And I hope, and certainly in our case, in the case of Exeter Hospital, the lessons are still fresh. Um, so in considering the prospects for payment health system, paying, innovating within the payment system of healthcare, uh, in 2015 and thinking beyond, there are several things that are really different in 2015 compared to the 1990s. Whether they are substantially different enough to create a momentum to change in a more sustainable way the affordability of healthcare, the patient care experience in healthcare, is still an open question. But I can tell you, perhaps for every provider system in the state of New Hampshire, arguably probably every provider system in the United States, the pursuit of a different paradigm as to the way healthcare is organized is being pursued diligently. So what's different? Certainly there's been significant movement in the integration of healthcare systems around this state, around the country. There are, in some select circumstances within this state as well as other parts of the country, very deep partnering uh, between insurers and healthcare providers to the point in which there's interesting corporate entities emerging for the sole purpose of rationalizing the way healthcare is delivered and the way it's financed. Information systems are slightly better. They are not even close to where they need to be if we really want to manage the population of a given community, of a given state, in a cost-effective way. The information systems that we have today were designed in the 70s and the 80s, and they've not really quite reached the level that they need to reach if we really want to achieve the goals of the triple aim. Disruptive technologies is a significant development, and it is rapidly changing the way we view how healthcare can be provided. Healthcare is no longer bound by the concept of geography and time. It's not so much now that you need to call your physician's office, schedule an appointment in two weeks, and then go to that physician's office to get primary care. 
doesn't have to happen. Disruptive technologies in the form of your, your, your smartphone is basically displacing the notion of time and geography when it comes to the consumption of healthcare. And that trend is only going to continue to accelerate, only limited by the regulatory framework that is still predicated in the 1960s. And last but not least, there is a greater degree of patient engagement. <clears throat> I've listened to some of the discussions here this morning. How do we get the patients in the center of this? And in fact, there is a level of patient engagement that is without precedent, precipitated by significant economic uh, pressures that were created by the economic recession, patients having to rationalize the, the limited household income they had in terms of do I buy groceries or do I skip on my medications? There is an emerging consumerism within healthcare patients, within patients around this country. Not as prevalent as when someone goes to buy a Ford pickup, but nonetheless, there is a degree of patient engagement that hasn't existed in this industry in a long time. How do we catalyze that as providers? How do we make them informed? How do we make them partner in rationalizing the decision making? And that becomes particularly clear for us as providers. When I look at some of the patients that we're caring for, and when I look at the associated medical expenses, when I know that one or two percent of, my, of the patients that are in our system are consuming 40 percent of the resources, it is a critical point of patient engagement. And the delivery system historically has not capitalized on that point of engagement that needs to occur. It's starting to. And obviously, compared to the 1990s, there are a lot of different forces in play. <clears throat> Everyone here sort of knows about them, the Affordable Care Act, CMS, CMS pronouncing that it wants to move a substantial part of its payment for Medicare beneficiaries to a value-based purchasing system. That's significant. There's, you know, there's, there's, that's a lot of weight and a lot of momentum when that starts to move that way. And notwithstanding that, obviously, all companies that many have represented here, the, the entire corporate base, the employment base, the industrial base of America, unlike the 1990s, is competing on a global basis enormous pressures on them to control, contain their cost of production so that they can remain globally competitive. That wasn't a factor really in a material way in the 1990s. It is very much today. We could go on a lot in terms of what's different today versus the 1990s, but that's just a, a, a highlight. <clears throat> so when we think about it nationally and when we think about it regionally, these circumstances, these forces, these changes, these dynamics have really precipitated pretty startling change. Some of it's obvious, some of it not so obvious. <clears throat> in this state, a lot of it's not so obvious, but the changes are beginning to run deep in terms of the way healthcare providers view themselves, view their relationship with their patients, and view the relationship with insurers, employers, and the entire federal government in the case of Medicare. We clearly see significant ins insurance industry consolidation, provider uh, consolidation occurring around the country, maybe not so much here in this state, and we also see, most importantly, the emergence of new entities trying to change the way healthcare is delivered. I'm getting my note. Did 10 minutes go by that fast? <laughs> Dang. All right, so, so what does this mean? So hopefully it'll leave you some thoughts. And, and these are a couple of fundamental things for you to think about. Fundamental to the change in, in health systems is the belief that they also need to move away from what has been historically fee-for-service paradigm, going back to the 1960s. As importantly, and this is, I think, something to truly understand, is that health systems recognize, and I think many entities recognize, that the current uh, approach where we're trying to balance fee-for-service, trying to balance value-based purchasing, maybe some kind of risk-sharing, capitation, this hodgepodge of different reimbursement systems, really represent an existential threat to the survivability, sustainability of health systems because you cannot master all of those in all of those domains. And so what you're seeing is health systems trying to drive toward this concept of population health management under some kind of a fixed budget. How that emerges, it's going to remain to be seen, but it is really quite interesting. And so what is the key consideration from my standpoint? There are many questions, obviously, that we need to consider. But I think fundamental for me is balancing the regulatory interests of the federal government and of the state government, many of, them, many of them represented here today, balancing those interests with the innovation, incubating the innovation that is beginning to take place in a material way. How do you stimulate that? How do you catalyze that? 
because as soon as we start to think about a regulatory framework that is going to propel innovation, it's kind of it's it's really not really necessarily compatible with stimulating innovation. And yet we want to balance the interests of our population and the consumers that are represented by patients. So that is the challenge, I think, is to inc is to encourage that incubation of change that is really happening at a startling pace in a very deep way. And so hopefully we'll get a chance to chat about that. So I'm sorry I ran 12 minutes. I need to, I need to keep the Do you want to keep that? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, Peter's already been introduced. We'll move right to him. And you will get the same piece of paper, Peter. Fair warning. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, nice <clears throat> to be here. I appreciate the opportunity from um, the Department of Insurance um, and uh, Tyler and Roger and others. Uh, thanks for putting this together. Uh, also, Joel, I, I appreciate the promotion, but I'm not the CEO of that four hospital system. I don't think I'd want to be. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's going to be a great opportunity for someone. Um, and um, I'm here really as a, 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 to, to represent, in essence, a, kind of a unique development going on in one part of, of New Hampshire. But first, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, there, the, the studies that were done and the, the speakers that have, we've heard have focused on a, on a certainly on the high level of health care spending in New Hampshire, but also um, the uh, importance of protecting health care access and quality at the same time. They, they, they need to be bundled together. Um, and up front, I think we've heard, I've heard from more than one speaker, that the government financed health care uh, insurance spending is actually running below average uh, in terms of cost. But that really then drives the commercial markets as above average. And, you know, the cost shift is alive and well in New Hampshire. Um, and there is certainly opportunity in commercial market spending. Uh, but I would like to put in some, in some kind of context that per capita costs in New Hampshire are certainly higher than the national average, but they're also the second lowest in New England, uh, behind only Vermont. Uh, Massachusetts is leading the pack at $9,278, and we're at $7,839, both too high. And it might tell you something interesting about New England, and that might be worth an analysis of some kind. Uh, but I think it's important to put it in perspective. So I'm um, a representing a unique area of the state. Now, I have a unique opportunity in that I live at up and work at opposite ends of the state. I work three days a week about 20 minutes south of the Canadian border in Colebrook. And I live about 20 minutes north of the Massachusetts border in Peterborough. So I get a unique perspective twice a week as I travel. Um, beautiful state, a little tedious when there's no light out, um, but different cultures, different healthcare resources, um, it, it different, different communities, so I get the opportunity to see that contrast every week. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the North Country in just a couple minutes, but I would like to uh, point out, as, as Jack aptly pointed out earlier, that reforms in provider payments cannot be looked at it in a vacuum. Um, and they, they have to be linked to reforms and innovations in payer payments, consumer payments, and employer payments. Um, and there are different approaches being taken by different provider groups, as you've heard, innovative approaches, but also by different payers working with provider groups. So I'm really interested in the next panel and what they're going to have to say about innovations going on in this state. Now, Compass and UMass have uh, looked at lots of information and considered a large number of potential reforms and approaches in New Hampshire. And they boiled down the options to nine recommendations in the paper that you have. Um, nice to hear it clearly stated that payment incentives that reward health plans and providers for providing high quality and cost are an essential component of these recommendations. They've also stressed transparency, achieving consensus, collaboration among key stakeholders, and aligning incentives. 
Um, they're also talking about consequences of non-action. Um, all of these, to me, seem, personally, these seem reasonable. But, of course, the devil's in the details. Uh, for instance, consequences of non-action, not being able to get an incentive uh, that's available, or even worse, being left out of the plan, is a pretty big incentive for a provider uh, to change behavior. There's two areas uh, that I do question, um, and I just, I just put it out there. One was the creation of a commission. Um, while it sounds good, it, it's been tried in New Hampshire, and there's, there's some issues, number one, with how we're going to get the funding for it. Uh, number two is how long does it take to get the conclusion? And three is how much clout will those conclusions really have? Who's going to listen to those conclusions? And in, in, a, in some ways, the horse is already out of the barn on some of the uh, developments in New Hampshire, as you heard from, from Kevin. Lo lots of things happening in New Hampshire, and in many ways we're, we're a model for the rest of the country in terms of these developments. And I think we need to have we, we need to keep up with those changes rather than slow them down. <clears throat> the other question I had is got to do with the reforming nonprofit requirements section. And I won't go into detail, but I would just say that the, the jurisdiction, and I respectfully say the jurisdiction of the Department of Insurance overlaps with the jurisdiction of another major state agency. And it would be nice to know that they're working in conjunction with each other to look at those, those uh, reforms for nonprofit requirements, because there is some progress going on in the state in those areas. There are three areas raised in the report which I strongly agree with. Um, one is that providers who have little influence when dealing with payers or newly uh, empowered employer groups because of size and location uh, should have mechanisms to sh assure provider solvency as these providers take on more risk. There are certain areas of the state um, where it's, it's a very fragile economy. Um, and I do think people recognize that in New Hampshire. Uh, but it's, it's worth noting um, that we, we don't want to um, throw the baby out with the bathwater or have unintended consequences of, of uh, what are, start off as good intentions. Secondly, there's some implications uh, in federal and state antitrust law when providers pursue innovative approaches and actions to fit into alternative payment models. You really need um, a critical mass of people for population health. And in areas that aren't densely populated, uh, there's really no choice. You have to work with other providers in order to get in the game in the first place. Um, so I, I do agree with the idea promoted that the state consider implementing a state action immunity doctrine in New Hampshire under certain circumstances with, it, with certain conditions. Third, there's reference in the report that healthcare markets of certain parts of New Hampshire are quite different, southern versus northern, for instance. So approaches that work in one region may not work as well in, the, in another region. <clears throat> Example, I work at the smallest hospital in the state. Um, and although two-thirds of New Hampshire residents are covered by private health insurance, at Upper Connecticut Valley Hospital, 58% uh, of patients are covered by Medicare and 13% by Medicaid. There's also self-pay on top of that. So that doesn't leave much left for, for private health insurance. So th there's, there's a lot of differences that one has to, to reckon with. Um, in Coas County, which many associate with the term North Country, um, Robert Wood Johnson has uh, done uh, the studies that they've done in conjunction with other organizations show that a higher percentage of need exists in Coas County than any other area of the state using a number of factors. We also have the lowest density of population and cover a wider geography. So it's different up there. Um, that's why when you, you're up there, they, they represent the rest of the state as down under. Uh, they also have fewer health care providers, and the hospitals up there are all considered critical access. 
So new payment delivery systems must be designed carefully to encourage efficiency, but also protect solvency, I believe. So the North Country hospitals that serve Coas County are, are four. And a year ago, they, the board signed a joint letter of intent to work together toward a stronger affiliation of those hospitals. And this is a unique development. I do not believe, or I'm not aware of any other development where you have four like small rural hospitals banding together to try to serve the community um, in their service area in this manner. Um, there's certain uh, advantages that the boards have recognized and in, in turn their administrative and medical staffs by working together. For instance, enhancing the ability to create a common information platform, identifying cost savings opportunities, creating sound clinical guidelines, and creating common means of coordinating care uh, along the continuum. And here's my warning. Um, and uh, we, we um, welcome the, the ability to work with, with payers um, and regulators and employers in trying to make this happen. So the, the, um, I, I've had the opportunity not only to be the interim CEO of that hospital, but also work with the other three CEOs to try to work to create a parent organization in, the, in, their, in their respective boards and medical staffs. And the parent organization, the basis of it uh, is that the parent looks at the region differently. It doesn't look from the vantage point of an individual hospital. It might be there, have a history of 50 to 100 years of operating independently and really competing with other hospitals. It's a different perspective. It's an advantage when you're looking at population health. Uh, it's also the one can create an infrastru infrastructure which could allow better efficiencies, less waste, more standardization and use of materials, pharmaceuticals, staffing, benefit structures. And also the parent could require that there be an integrated approach to clinical work, operations, finances, and even governance. So there's lots of opportunities. It's, an, it's really actually a lot of fun to work with these organizations. And the next step beyond the four hospitals is to reach out to the other related healthcare related agencies, such as the uh, federally qualified health of FQHCs, the home care agencies, the long term care agencies, et cetera. And there are some strategies being formulated right now to make that happen. So it's an exciting prospect, and I'm hoping that uh, innovative thinkers and in the Department of Insurance and other uh, parts of the state uh, government uh, will continue to be supportive of the involvement of this and, and do what's needed to be done to help this innovation happen and so we can continue to serve the needs of the North Country. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, we've heard from two leaders, very different types of hospitals. Now we're going to hear from the doctor. Um, Stephanie, and then we'll get to uh, questions. I know there'll be some from the audience. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this morning, and I do want to apologize in advance to other panel members and to community members uh, for my need to um, leave after the panel, but I have many colleagues uh, throughout the audience that I know will help me to understand some of the concerns and uh, some of the points that you raise. Um, I feel a huge responsibility today on behalf of my colleagues uh, you know, on healthcare teams throughout the state as the only clinician uh, that's been invited to speak today. And there's so much to talk about relative to the huge opportunities that we have, to Kevin's point, the innovations. And in the words of your uh, report, to develop a shared long-term vision of promoting the health of our fellow citizens in New Hampshire but my allotted time today will only allow me to touch on a few of the strategies that my colleagues and I are working on today on behalf of citizens throughout New Hampshire. The first thing I want to touch on is population health. The inherent value of population health perspective 
is that it facilitates integration of knowledge across the many factors that influence health and health outcomes. In its report on the public health in the 21st century, the Institutes of Medicine, the IOM, called for significant movement in what they call building a new generation of intersectoral partnerships that draw on the perspectives and resources of diverse communities and actively engage them in health action. In such an environment, isolated indicators, such as outcome measures or policies, are relevant, but they should be recognized as only a part and not the whole. So what are the key elements of the initiatives of the innovations that my colleagues and I are engaged in? Well, it involves integrating health management and wellness, wellness initiatives which include things like immunizations and screenings for early detection and treatment of disease, and lifestyle coaching for things like smoking cessation, weight management, and appropriate levels of activity. But these may involve very different things for different populations, different solutions, different priorities, even to some of the points that Peter made within a small state such as ours. It's very labor intensive. It also involves condi condition and disease management for so-called ambulatory sensitive conditions like asthma, diabetes, congestive heart failure, um, and even end-stage renal disease before a patient has to go on dialysis. And it's working with patients on a, an approach that's customized and not unilateral, that treats the patient and not the condition. And it examines the root cause of the patient's condition, not just the condition itself. Very labor intensive. It also involves complex care management for conditions like cancer and stroke and diabetes for those patients who have gone on to have complications for patients with end-stage renal disease that have gone on to dialysis. And it's working not just with patients, but mu multiple specialists and multidisciplinary healthcare teams, which include innovative roles and coaches such as embedded care coordinators, community providers, patients, and families for support systems to help achieve the best possible outcomes while rewarding and stewarding the use of resources to achieve those outcomes. This occurs knowing that for individual medical conditions or even for individual patients with the same medical condition, that there's no single measure or outcome that can capture the results of care, the value of that care. It encompasses things not only like um, functional status, and the sustainability of a remission in their disease, but also other measures such as survival, to name a few. Very labor intensive. And it also involves, as been, has been alluded to this morning, a rich program of data analytics. Taking data, turning it into knowledge, taking that knowledge and turning it into wisdom and innovating well beyond the present state and timeliness and variability in the definitions of available quality indicators and cost metrics, which only begin to touch on the elements that I've listed. Very labor intensive, very expensive. So how do we achieve all the things, all the promise um, that has been touched upon today. In a 2010 paper uh, called What is the Value in Healthcare, published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School, he wrote that in any field, improving performance and accountability depends on having shared goals that unite the interests and activities 
of all stakeholders, what we might call collaborative sweet spots. From my perspective, a reference point refined over years as an internist, a specialist, a physician leader, a healthcare consumer, a caregiver. Collaboration meant to encompass sharing of knowledge, exchange of best practices, coordinations of activities and efforts, effective communication and relationship building for the continuity of that experience. Collaboration is the most essential ingredient for success in re-engineering the healthcare delivery and healthcare experience for the benefit of each of the stakeholders in the equation. The list of who and where must uh, the collaboration occur to achieve our goals uh, runs the gamut. Uh, it's providers working with payers, as is now happening with the Granite Health Network uh, organizations and Tufts in the form of the Tufts Freedom Health Plan. It's providers building relationships with patients, as is now happening in the individual's health systems, including those that comprise granted health work, engaging people in lifestyle choices, educating and empowering patients around treatment choices, coordination of care, and stewarding their use of tests, medicines, non-pharmacologic treatments, and even something as basic as when we should focus on the use of antibiotics versus antibiotic stewardship or the judicious use of antibiotics for the health, welfare, and safety of individual patients and the community and its families and communities of patients, nonprofits and civil organizations working towards shared goals like the Healthy Eating Active Living Program promoted and sponsored by the Foundation for Healthy Communities, the sharing of knowledge, training, education, and actions. These are very daunting tasks in an environment where there are so many uncertainties. Uncertainties not just in the demographics of our aging population in New Hampshire, not just in funding and reimbursement for the kinds of care coordination and health promotion activities that have been discussed today, not just in access to care, not just in the availability of critical wraparound services, not just in regulatory environment, in who the partners will be and what will their priorities be not just in the infrastructure and support systems and the societal fabric necessary to uh, achieving and maintaining health, but also in an environment where we struggle with the alignment of essential priorities of the different stakeholders, including patients, for the reasons uh, that have been enumerated. There are many, many disruptors to the shared goals and collaborations that healthcare providers are trying to promote throughout the state, including site of service programs, and entrepreneurial entities that would tell you that they're here to save money for the state of New Hampshire, for the citizens of New Hampshire, by offering episodic care at lower cost, but who are not building the relationships and the infrastructure and the partnerships that limit the use of episodic care and who did not position themselves and their resources to attend to our health independent of our financial or social resources, or the status of our physical or mental health, or contributing to community benefit. New Hampshire has a long and proud history of being first in the nation for many things, including for many years, top in performance on those nationally reported quality metric indicators that have been available. It's my hope that collaboration and dialogue that occur as a result of this report and the remarks were made today will help us to lead in the types of innovation that will achieve the goals that we seek. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Those were three very uh, informative and passionate uh, presentation. Stephanie, particularly thank you to you for not making me put that piece of paper up there. I would have been too nervous to do it to you. So <laughs> you were really into that. Um, so I, I said I'd ask each of the panelists a question, but I'm now in the interest of time going to ask one question of all three panelists, get them to react to this, and then we'll, you can be thinking of your questions in the audience. 
And the question is something that was brought up this morning by the COMPASS team and others has kind of woven into all of your comments, which is we have here today kind of the commercial traditional insurance marketplace, which is, I learned early on, like a third of the overall health insurance marketplace. And in that sphere, the providers, the insurers, pretty well organized, pretty integrated, a lot of consolidation going on. Um, but we've talked several times about the, uh, the uh, employer side, the purchasing side. And so some of the things that aren't here today are the Medicaid purchasing block, which is getting bigger now that the Medicaid uh, uh, purchasers are going to go into the QHPs. Smart insurance principles there. There's a whole state employee uh, group, four different kinds of groups here in this state, as I understand it. Huge purchasing power there. And then there are the self-insured employers, which I think somebody was talking earlier about how they're probably going to grow based on how the shop regulations are set up uh, today. So you have all of that purchasing power on the employer side. I'd like each of you to react to is if that got more organized, should that get more organized too, consolidated? Is that a helpful from your perspective on the provider side, is it helpful to have those uh, those purchasing powers together more organized, or is it you like it the way it is? And I'll start with Kevin. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I guess on some level, maybe I'm agnostic to that question. Um, you know, the the ability to pool resources, to pool intellectual capital, to pool financial resources for the purposes of more efficiently procuring health care, that's a good thing, yeah, I, I think, regardless of the setting. What I'm really tied into, though, is purchasing health care under what model? Fee-for-service, fixed budget, capitation. That's really the question, because how you purchase your services and the incentives that are created really dictate um, you know, the ultimate value that you're getting for that pooled, uh, uh, pooling of resources. And so. I kind of begin at the beginning in terms of how do you organize really effectively for whether it's for a large self-insured uh, employer, uh, whether it's Medicaid, managed Medicaid, uh, Medicare in the case of ACO, how does the health system organize itself to rationally deliver that care knowing that there's a constraint on resources, that there's a proposition for value and that we have to improve quality. And so if in fact you pool all those resources without a rationalized, differently organized healthcare system, you're not going to necessarily produce the same effect that you're achieving if, in fact, the health system is rationalized and organized to deliver value. So I think you have to consider both propositions. Okay, That's so, Peter, is, is, what are the pros and cons of, up in um, northern New Hampshire of a more organized employer purchasing <laughs> block? Um, I'm going to approach it a little differently. Good. That we have, uh, we've had some successes in looking at a, a program called Lean, which is really a, a re focusing on reduction of waste. And the biggest successes come when you break down barriers between departments or between organizations. Uh, there's always ways to look for efficiencies within a department, but the biggest impact is when you start focusing on processes together. And I think that breaking down those barriers is critical. And collaboration, as Stephanie had mentioned and underscored, is key here. Uh, that we have to find a way to stop looking at each other as the enemy, so to speak. But, and work together for a common goal, which is improving the health care of the organization of the, um, the communities we serve, higher quality, reduce cost, but also viability of the organizations that are providing the service. We don't want to, um, you know, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So, in the in the North Country, that latter concern is is paramount to me, based on what I've seen there. It's fragile. Um, but I, and I, but I do believe there's a heightened sensitivity among the key players within New Hampshire to that fact. And um, I, 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 would, I would welcome a collaborative effort w with more organized employer groups uh, and other groups, uh, as long as we have the, the, this ability to look at our goal together, have the patience to see it through, uh, and then have some, some tools to use to measure success and break down those barriers. So let me probe just one more step because there, a lot of your comments have been sort of like what you mostly hear in states where they're talking about the rural part of the state. The, the, the government side is organized as it should be. It's got too many demands coming at us from too many different places. That were some of your comments and sort of here too. Does an organized employer purchasing power help or hurt kind of breaking down those barriers? Depends on the attitude they have coming into the okay. um, arrangement. Is it 
um, is it a demand or is it a collaboration? And um, I think that the, the more we can move toward um, recognizing that we're all here for a common objective, the better we're going to be able to um, uh, produce results. Um, and that goes for all parties, including providers, too. So, Stephanie, maybe this, uh, you're put on your policy hat a bit here because, uh, you know, it's hard to answer from the doctor's side, but on the policy side and all these things you've been involved in, does it, do you wish for more kind of organized purchasing power on the employer side, or do you say, uh, that, might, that might make for too many demands or it might be inflexible? What, what's your reaction? So, the way I, can you hear me? Okay. The way that I would frame it is this. There's talk about power, and I want to talk about empowerment. So to me, when you talk about power, that says to me that there is an unevenness to what the different parties have and want, and, and, and it is uh, hierarchical. And I don't hear the word patient in there. And so to me, when you talk about power and consolidation, I am concerned that that would in some ways impede innovation, impede collaboration, um, and impede the types of initiatives that I've touched on today. And so I don't know what the right answer is, but I do think that it is not necessarily leading to the kind of collaboration that I see as the important ingredient of how we can move forward on behalf of the patients that we seek to serve. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, we'll go to the audience. Uh, who wants the first question? Bellbound by these, these guys. <laughs> Tyler. Um, concerning things on the policy front, do you think that uh, the New Hampshire legislature should essentially stay away from what you're doing, or do you think they can play a role in, in improving the situation and moving things forward? Um. <laughs> there, is a, there are some legislators in the room, so. <laughs> Yes and yes. Uh, <laughs> truly. Uh, and so I mean, that's the balance, isn't it? Um, in, in a state, uh, it's a relatively small state. And as I mentioned to, to you, Joel, 1.3 million people. We've got certainly geographical challenges in terms of access to health care, resource distribution challenges uh, associated with that geography. Um, and yet you would think that this really should be an incubator for innovation. And there is, on some organic level now, uh, occurring within the health system scattered around the state, a very deep commitment uh, and action to fundamentally change the paradigm of the way healthcare is provided, the way it's financed. If I could take you into my day 10 years ago and what was on my agenda versus what it is today, you would think that there are two different people in this room. And, and that's important. Because when you get alignment amongst the thought leaders, executives, physicians, ultimately patients, then ultimately those who pay to a commitment to change what is, it's incredibly powerful. Now, what's the, what's the challenge for the legislature? How do you appropriately stimulate that and not extinguish that embryonic movement? Um, and you have to understand that movement to change is occurring in, an in, in a regulatory infrastructure that is outdated doesn't even remotely contemplate the changes that are occurring here, either technically, economically, or otherwise. And so all the efforts of, of providers to navigate to a point of innovation is despite all the odds of doing that and all the regulatory risk of doing that. And so it, it's a really, it's a great question from the standpoint of legislative intent uh, is to how do you balance a more enlightened view of recognizing you've got to create oxygen for innovation you got to meet the mandates of the state in terms of security and safety and consumer protections and all those other things. But how do you tilt more toward innovation and incubation? 
And that's, that is the question, and that's what a lot of us think about right now. But it's, uh, and I think it's a great policy question. How you create that, how you stimulate that, how do you engage the real, you know, the, all the stakeholders that we talk about? We're talking about engaging stakeholders for the sake of transforming the healthcare delivery system into something that currently doesn't exist. The only way you're going to do that, I think, in my way, in my thinking, is to have a lot of different experiments going on in a, little, a lot of different marketplaces. And there's clearly a role for regulatory oversight of that. Um, but not regulatory impediment. I thought it all started with Obamacare. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Do you guys want to speak to that, or do we? Just, have a just a comment that I, uh, I applaud the legislators who are in this room, who have gotten engaged <coughs> and involved in it, because the more information they have, uh, I think we're all going to be better off. And um, I, I agree with what Kevin said, 110%. Do you want to come on that one, or do we want to go to the next one? I, I feel compelled to remark, it scares me as a provider. And it scares me because while I think Kevin is absolutely right about providing that oxygen and the possibilities, recent history has not given me, given my colleagues, the type of confidence in the types of decisions that are made and the focus of those decisions to move us forward. And part of it is because this cannot just be about hospitals. And I, I know we're at the insurance department. But it can't be just about hospitals and it can't just be about payers. It has to be about individual accountability. It has to be about community accountability and all those wraparound things and resources and infrastructure that support health because providing health just in the context of medications and treatments and testing and even those provider relationships cannot be sustainable and cannot be economically sustainable if when those people go back out into the community they don't have those things. Thank you. Um, next question? The All right, I'm going to sneak another one in then, um, Tom. I mean, Kevin, you talked <laughs> about this technology being the disruptor mm -hmm. that's changing the world. I think that's right. Um, I'd like to think that in 10 years, people are going to get a lot of their information, my kids anyway, off this kind of device, and it's going to be simplified, boiled down, and all of that, and it has all kinds of different potentials. Mm -hmm. Do you, want to, do you guys want to speak to how you, you see the IT as a disruptive force for good and bad in the healthcare marketplace? No, absolutely. Um, go, go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, no, no, you go. You have a mic. I have a mic. All right, all right. So I promised I wouldn't walk out with this mic. So um, it really, it's, it's really actually quite startling. I mean, I, I, and I think so. I don't know what the question was in terms of how many transistors are, you know, in your, your, uh, your power of uh, space shuttles. I think there's about three or four billion transistors on that one chip in your phone. We as an organization are actively engaged with new entrants into the healthcare marketplace uh, from a technology standpoint that are fundamentally trying to redefine the nature, the nature of a patient provider transaction. And these are uh, uh, organizations that have nothing to do with healthcare. I mean, if you think about it, healthcare is $3 trillion a year. It's ripe for transition and it's ripe for disruption. And these are disruptors that have been very successful in other industries. Why should healthcare be exempt? And so with that comes a lot of unknown consequences. We look at the power of technology as a way to deal with many issues that are beginning to surface. The insufficiency of providers. We have a, a, you know, 315 million people in the country, many of them newly insured. We have a diminishing provider population because of demographic aging, changes in the workforce. We have an expectation of increased contact. I was listening to you speak about how is it, how did we get a physician to sit down with a patient to talk about the, the, the cost benefit of a given treatment decision? Well, under a fee for service, they've got 15 minutes to do that because they have to see 30 more patients after that. So, the, so we, we clearly see that the expectations of patient engagement and, and intelligent engagement the current systems that we have in place won't work. And so we look at those kind of technologies as empowering patient information, the ability to engage our providers on the patient's terms. So if they're sitting in an office building uh, on State Street in Boston and they've got a question about something re regarding a wound being healed after they had gallbladder surgery, 
Why do they have to come to Exeter to get that, that done? Why do they? Well, there's a lot of regulations that say we can't do that for them. What a sin. But the regulatory framework in this country never moves at the pace of innovation. So woe to us to try to impose more regulations that's going to further impede innovation. So we see this with all its uncertainties. I mean, when you sit down from people coming to sit with us from Cupertino, California, who know nothing about healthcare but figure out a way to disrupt your fundamental legacy business models, it's a very brave new world. And so I, you know, my view is that healthcare is, needs to not only embrace the changes in technology, understand how they add value to the patient, and how can they create economy in the sense of other industries in this country because you know the United States healthcare system has been refractory to any kind of improvement in productivity and efficiency because it doesn't lend itself easily to the patient physician transaction in a in a technological way as opposed to other you know, other transactions in a consumer basis so it is a there's no question it, it's it's a very different world but we see it opportunistically a lot of uncertainties with it but from a patient convenience standpoint why not? So take it from the patient side. Is it helping Northern? Is it an access thing, telemedicine, all that? Is it really a, a game changer in a positive way? Or what are the pros and cons, uh, uh, Peter? I would it's just um, anyone who has children in this audience, and even and those too young to have children, you understand anyway, um, it's kind of the just-in-time generation. And so you want something, you order it today on Amazon, you get it tomorrow, and you get the best price. You're on your way to a restaurant and you pull up Yelp and you figure out before you, after you've left home, before you hit the restaurant, oh, this one is rated number two and this is the menu and this is the average price and this is the quality rating. It's, it's the expectation level has increased tremendously and it, it, it overflows in every sector. Um, and so telemedicine is one of those sectors. You know, um, in, in the not too distant future, at UCBH, which, you know, is two and a quarter hours from here, it a very sparsely populated area, we'll be able to, if someone comes in with a possible stroke, get an expert on the phone from New Mexico, from a, a medical center that specializes in stroke, to look at the patient and figure out whether they need a particular drug or not. Uh, but that's nothing special. That's going to be standard. Um, if you're going to be in the game, you're going to have to be able to, to, to work with technology. Stephanie, is it good for your patients to have this new technology? I think it's critical, and it is upon us to break down the barriers that prevent that from happening. I will speak not as a health care provider or as an administrator, but as a grandmother. I have an 18-month-old grandson who got a very rough start to life. So I've had an up-close and personal experience with chronic care management and the burdens on families who deal with illness. And the health care systems are not designed to make it easier. Right now, they're designed to make it harder. I can tell you that the reason that your doctor can't tell you what things will cost is because they would need a complex computer program and another half an hour for every appointment. What's your insurance? What's your copay? Are you bronze or silver or copper? Or have you met your deductible? It's just astounding. There are lots of examples, not only in this country, but in other countries, of how people are using disruptive technology in order to help patients with being able to participate, engage in their treatment, for example, there's an innovation now in France where people with chronic arthritis can get a, a competency from their provider in how to examine their joints and instead of traveling miles and miles from remote rural areas, can patch into their provider and decide if they need those tests, if they need those treatments. And we need to create the kind of incubator environment that lets that happen. Thank you. So I, Tyler, I'm looking at the clock. Are we one, one more or are we done? <laughs> Okay, so may have one more? <coughs> uh, maybe people want to get to the next panel right. too. Or, 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 Rachel, do you want to ask the last question? Go ahead. I thought I'd take advantage of you all being here. How do you see um, 
changes and payment reform affecting your clients, your patients, with respect to all the cultural differences you see, whether it be race or language or income? How is that going to affect your ability to be culturally competent? Tackle Everybody's this. looking at me. Well, um, she, and that's fine. I think she referenced your patient. Uh, <laughs> look, it's a challenge in today's environment. I talked about the changing de demographics relative to the aging of our population. But New Hampshire has had a sea change in the last 25 years in the number of patients that come from different cultural environments, speak different languages, the need to have translators and language lines. And you know, I talked about the individualization of healthcare outcomes. Desired healthcare outcomes are not the same in different cultural frames. And to the extent that we create the kind of rules or regulations that prevent us from doing that kind of customization or a failure to understand the upfront costs and the long-term benefits of that customization, I think that we impede the kind of progress that we've been talking about today. <laughs>